I'm going to continue in this study. This is lesson 25, basics number 520. And I entitled this lesson, Making Your Life Count. Making Your Life Count uh, in our study of the doctrine of God's imputations. And blessings and time is the category. And I won't review the other categories that we've already looked at. Uh, it's important to understand them as they are. I'm pretty sure you fully understand understand them and their implications because all understanding is to have an implied change to our thinking and forming our thinking. That's what the Word of God does. It forms our thinking uh, so that we have a divine philosophy of life rather than a human and secular philosophy of life. God has his own philosophy, his way of dealing with the mind and that's where we draw upon for our decisions, for the way we reflect, whether we are rejoicing or we are, are leaking ourselves into a state of some form of depression. And so there are different things that affect the joy that can be brought about in our life, and there are things that can affect uh, the, uh, uh, the, the depressive thoughts and despondency that and, uh, and anxiety that can come about in our lives. And the Word of God uh, helps us to see it from His perspective. And we can put that template of His Word and His thoughts uh, into our thoughts, His ways becoming our ways, transforming our life into thinking the way He thinks, which is exactly how the Son of God thinks. As we think about as the Son thought, that's the way the Father thinks. And so we... We learn the word to make that alignment. We become adjusted to the righteous standard and we become adjusted to the divine point of view where divine viewpoint is supreme over human viewpoint. Human viewpoint has the propensity of being flawed. And so uh, most times it is. And if there's anything good in human viewpoint, it was acquired through the conscience of which God put that common sense in there. When people are trying to the couple from God, as Psalm chapter 2, verses 2 and 3 tells us, when people are trying to decouple from God, they decouple from common sense. And when they decouple from common sense, they decouple from what's best for them. It's best for people to love one another rather than hate one another. It's best for people to care for the welfare of others rather than to use them. But when you decouple from God and your conscience becomes callous, what God thinks no longer matters in your conscience. And unsaved people have a conscience, Romans 1.19 tells us. They're born with it. And God puts his template to a degree of the divine standards of, to a degree in that conscience. That's why you don't have to be told if you lie to your parents as a little kid, you didn't have your parents to tell you what a lie is. You already know. There is a moral standard that you are born with. God puts it in you. Romans 1, 19 teaches that. So when we walk away from God, we are walking away from our conscience. We are also walking away from our social or society conscience, our desire to do right by our loved ones and our neighbors, i.e. society. That's what we're seeing today uh, everywhere. That's unfortunate. We need to get back to the right type of thinking. I'm going to ask you to turn to Second Chronicles chapter 7, a very familiar passage as we're going to look at that in Making Your Life Count. We talked last time about uh, historical impact blessings. Wednesday night we talked about historical impact blessings, how important your life is uh, that you leave behind uh, an impact because it has direct correlation to your 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 blessings at the judgment seat of Christ. And it's important for us to understand that. Not just how your work life is. We talked about that in Colossians chapter two. That there, are, excuse me, Colossians chapter three. That there is a correlation between your work life and the blessings of God, in, in the, at the beam of seat of Christ. And there's a correlation between your testimony and the judgment seat of Christ. You can leave behind uh, through your testimony, through the memory that people have of you, 
a sweet savor unto God that God in turn, because you are honoring Him with your lifestyle, God will take that that you have brought a positive influence into someone else's life and translate that into actual blessings at the Bema Seat of Christ. And the example that we gave Wednesday night was the life of Joseph, how his brothers meant it for evil, but God let him let it happen for their good, for Joseph's good. And uh, we went over some of that Wednesday night uh, in that regard of historical impact. God used him to impact the salvation, as it were, an example uh, in type to Israel because uh, he had the right man in the right place at the right time so that when the drought came in Canaan, there was a place where they could go and there was someone there as an ally amongst the Egyptians and that was their own brother Joseph. Of course, they weren't aware that it was him uh, that was Mr. High and Mighty in the cabinet until he snuck his uh, goblet into their bag uh, just so he would uh, be able to stop them outside of the town and so they would have a reason to be fearful. And then he showed himself, as you know, and uh, they thought for sure they were done for. And then he realized he showed them that he was their brother. He didn't have anything against them. And he was concerned about his father. He's concerned about his younger brother, Benjamin, who had not come down. But God blessed them. And he was there from the time he was 17 to the time I think he was 37 when they came down there. And when they came down, he was a mature man. He wasn't a boy anymore. He wasn't a stooge. Uh, he was learned. He was versed. He held a testimony for God even in Egypt. And he was respected to the degree that he was number two in the in, in the empire. This is not like a, a lieutenant governor in a state. He was number two in an empire. So, because uh, he, because he was the vessel of God's wisdom, he was light in a place of darkness. And God impressed upon Pharaoh and even Potiphar, but not Potiphar's wife, of course. She was, uh, she was a Jezebel. So, um, but he stood up to what was wrong, and he stood up for what was right. And God used the impact of his life to bless all the tribes of Israel. Matter of fact, his Testimony was a blessing to all the Gentile nations around the Mediterranean during that severe period of drought. God can use you and have impact with your life that is a blessing to others in time, but it accrues blessing for you at the beam of seat of Christ because everybody that says, thank God for Joseph, God got the credit for it. And when God gets the credit for things that we do that are right in our life, whether it's not doing what we ought not do or doing what we ought to do, that credit brings glory to God. And every time that God receives glory, He wants to see it. He wants it to be seen. And it's going to be seen in your life, in part in time, but at the beam of seat of Christ for all eternity, uh, it'll be a tremendous, tremendous uh, way that God can show that this person, this man, this woman, uh, honored me to such a degree that uh, I'm going to let them shine, have a little piece of my Shekinah glory uh, to share. That's part of glorification. Glorification is just is not just a nice suit from Suit City uh, to put on your resurrected uh, body. <laughs> and the hat to go with it, of course. Much, much more. <laughs> Making your life count. Uh I want to talk about a nation's preservation as a blessed nation. That's based upon the relationship the believer in Christ develops with God through the Word of God. A nation's preservation as a blessed nation. Our little thing on the front of our bulletin says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Psalm 33 and verse 12. I kind of like to use patriotic themes when we have a uh, uh, something to do with the military or for our freedom on occasion, and since Friday is uh, Veterans Day, I thought that would be a good day to, to do that. I think that's the 11th. 
Blessed is a nation whose God is the Lord. Jehovah. Not some other false God, but Jehovah. But a nation's preservation as a blessed nation is based upon the relationship the believer uh, in Christ develops with God through the Word of God and through obedience. And number two, the association of the spiritually mature believer has with others in turn blesses others. So we learn the Word, we learn the plan of God, and then we share the Word in our life and our testimony and we are living out the plan of God for our lives and faith. And as I said, the darker it is, the brighter your light shines. And we don't need to run from the darkness. Jesus didn't run from the darkness. He came into the darkness when he came into this world. And Jesus says, as long as you have me here, you've got light. And he expects us now to be lights and not to hide our lights under baskets, you know. No secret uh, uh, witnesses for the Lord. No witness protection plan for us. No secret hideouts for Christians. It takes a maximum intake of the Word plus the subsequent testing of those teachings of that Word in that believer's life to develop a mature believer. And there's not enough emphasis on maturing as a believer. A lot of ideas about what maturity looks like, but the word is often uh, left out of that uh, calculation. It cannot be left out of that calculation. You see, it takes knowledge of the Bible to mature. And of course, knowledge alone does not mature. So it also takes humility and faith. It takes humility to sit and to learn and then to apply the Bible to practice what we preach as it were so positional righteousness comes automatically at the moment you believe in the lord but practicing righteousness that is practicing the standards of what we learn from the word that comes through consistent year after year obedience to the word of god and for many christians this is too boring for a christian life they need excitement. They need some new vistas to see, some new journey to take, some new road to be on, some new tingling sensation in their flesh to make them sense that God is alive when they don't realize that His Spirit bears witness with our spirit, not our flesh. It takes obedience to the truth to create the outcome God wants for a people. If we're going to be a blessing to our nation, we must be first obedient to learned truth. Being saved and having prayer vigils is not enough to impact a nation for God. I've, I've done one of those in my life uh, for the prayer for the nation uh, things. I did it for an employee, uh, a business, several years ago, and it was fine. But being saved and having prayer vigils is not enough to impact a nation for God. We can pray to our faces blue, but if we're not going to be obedient to the word, then it's a wasted prayer. The Bible says the prayer of a righteous man availeth much, not the prayer of desperate people. Those saved must learn and obey the word of the Lord to have impact. I've said that a couple of times in different ways this morning, but you and I do not have impact for God just because we pray for it. We say, I want to do what's good for God, and I want to do what's good for my neighbor, and I want to do what's good for my nation. Well, then do it. <laughs> we can't just be hearers, but we have to be doers also. And I think some folks don't like the do the doing part, so they don't want to have the hearing part, because they don't want to sense that there's culpability. But I'm going to tell you with God, there's no such thing as plausible deniability. There is no such thing, if we're born-again believers, for plausible deniability. Nobody flies under the radar with God, especially his children. We're, we're, the, we're the apple of his eye. Israel, you know, we talk about as a nation, but as individuals, humans on this planet, we're the apple of his eye. Jesus said the path 
uh, to leads to destruction is broad and wide, and many people take it, but he said few there are that take the narrow path that leads to righteousness, which he is the gatekeeper. Very few take that path. He knew that. He offered the path, but he knew that very few would take it. And so for us to have impact, we have to have taken the path of salvation in Christ alone and also learn to live that by being in Christ means there are times when we're going to go swim against the stream, go against the grain, as they say. But we must be willing to come to church as a place that Christ ordained that we should have. That's per Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 through 16. He ordained that there would be a place where we can listen and learn and fellowship and cooperate one with another like the parts of a building and joint together, working together. And so if we come to church for something that we might think is a higher purpose than that, then we have failed the grace of God and we're going to have little impact for God. So in Second Chronicles chapter 7, a very familiar passage, we heard a lot of this after 9-1-1 or 9-11, but we hear it at other times as too. But this passage gives to us a promise the Lord gave Solomon, king of Israel. And I believe the principles of this promise given by God to Solomon applies to any nation today. It's not just America. Any nation could apply this if they would. So this proclamation made by God has several components. Again, if my people. Verse 12, And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven that there be is no rain, that's Psalm 33 and verse 12, or if I command the locusts to devour the land as he had in Egypt, or if I send pestilence along my people. In other words, if God brings dis- sorrow and suffering and destruction because of the wickedness of the people, then that can change. That can change. Because he says here that if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, that's usually left out, and turn from their wicked ways, that's usually left out, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. A lot of people, when they read this verse, and you hear it said sometimes, they'll say, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray, then I will hear from heaven and heal their land. I've heard it done that way. They've left the sin out. They've left the seeking God out. That's uh, deceitfully handling the word of God. This promise is a promise that God gave to Solomon that I think applies to any nation who sees themselves in a, in a pickle like we are in America now that will apply it. So the first, I want to break it down a little bit. If my people who are called by my name, first of all, this divine proclamation is addressed to born again believers. Yes, Israel had a lot of believers looking toward to the cross uh, at that time. There were a lot of unsaved people, but there were saved people too. But he's re- addressing his people who are called by my name. You see, we are the salt of the earth. The unbeliever is not the salt of the earth. So if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves, shall humble themselves. Now we have a if we have a right attitude towards the Lord, that will be an attitude of humility. But toward one another, respect for one another as such, but we'll have the right attitude toward the Lord so that we will be in the right frame of mind to pray for help. If we're arrogant and angry, unless we pray for God's forgiveness for that arrogance and that anger, that that unnecessary anger we need to be careful that when we approach the throne of God that we approach the throne of God take a deep breath before you approach the throne of God it doesn't do any good to approach the throne of God in arrogance and anger he's not going to hear it we have to have a right attitude we must prepare our heart before we go to prayer in these cases it's not flippant just rattling off some printed piece of paper. Our motivations must be pure and sincere. God can see right through it. Hebrews 4.12 says that he, he can see our hearts. So we need to know our place as the children of God when we come humble before God. Romans 9, 
20 and 21 says, Nay, but, O man, who art thou that replies against God? Shall the thing forms say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay? And in 1 Peter 5, 6 says, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that it may lift you up in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. And so we understand that. James 4, 6 through 10 tells us if we'll humble ourselves before God, that he will entreat us, that he will hear our prayer. So if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves, have the right attitude, and pray, you know, we can't bless ourselves out of our problems. We need to pray for his supernatural intervention. We need his supernatural intervention. I can tell you Congress is not going to be able to fix the problems that we have. The Board of Supervisors will not be able to fix the problems we have. The school board will not be able to fix the problems that we have. We need a divine intervention. We ask God then in our prayer for his guidance, which means if we're not under the filling of the Holy Spirit, we won't get it. We'll go in with our presupposed ideas and we're going to just do them anyway and we'll just use in prayer as nothing more than a front of our alleged holiness. When we have the right attitude, we ask God for his guidance and we ask him for his help because we acknowledge that we are in a desperate need of his grace and intervention. And we must be willing to accept what that intervention looks like. And that's something that we don't always welcome. But when there's a problem that needs to be fixed, we know that there's going to be pain associated with fixing the problem. Often we want there to be this smooth transition from problem to no problem. Just like this. Problem, no problem. Uh -uh. There's going to be pain associated because God is going to root out what the problem is. And in rooting it out, there's going to be some ground torn up. There's going to be some changes that don't have to be made. With us and with whomever else it may involve, if it we're in part of this. We have problems that only God can solve, but we are to cast those cares upon him, for he cares for us, as First Peter 5, 7 says. So we pray, we, and we let God know that we are in desperate need of his help, and we're willing to accept what he does. We might not like it. Most likely, we will not. But he will fix the problem. And sometimes we're not fully aware of what the problem is. We just know there's a problem. But he can fix it. And that's what we should want. We said to just keep on putting a band-aid over the symptoms. He needs we want God to fix the problem. Oh, he can do it. If it's his will. So if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek his face, he says, and seek my face which is a term meaning to come face to face with the word of God. We need to learn the will of God. We need to learn the word of God. Hebrews 11, 6 says he is a reward of them who seek his face, who diligently seek after him. He's not saying that he's a reward of those who flounder around seeking him, but spudazo means as a student, seek him. And what do we do when we have heard from God? <laughs> He's expecting us to take it. He expects us then to carry his water. <laughs> he expects us to carry that, that information in our own hearts, our own homes, and in our society. Do we let his admonitions and instructions be of no effect? Do we continue to do wrong thinking and wrong living after we have sought his face? Because if that's the case, the hammer's coming. And once he sends the dogs off the porch, he's not calling them back until they've done their job. The first, and that's Isaiah taught that. And that's something that sometimes we don't want to imagine that the horrible things that can be as a result of God getting justice. We talk about those beautiful passages about justice coming out that's like the sound of thunder in the heavens and the water rolling down like waters of, of powerful sound, like a, a thunderous, uh, 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 waterfall, like the voice of God and his justice coming down, that is not going to be a pretty sight. But it, it, it'll be a fixing a problem. 
like a hurricane or tornado going through. The first phase of true repentance, then, is honesty before God. King David put it this way in Psalm 139, 23 and 24. Search me, O God. Know my heart. Try me. Know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me. Lead me in the way everlasting. That's refreshing, but it's also painful. That's okay. It gets the problem addressed, the problem solved. Then he says, and seek his face. And then after he has shown us that the dirt, the, when we washed our face in light of his beautiful face, that the water in our sink is dirty compared to him, then he says, you know, then turn from our wicked ways. It's not enough to learn God's word and God's remedy for the things that are wrong, for the things that we were done out of our unfaithfulness, but also to repent. Metanoia, the Greek word, means to have a change of mind with a corresponding change of action. It's not a 360, it's a 180. We have actually not turned our back on the world. We've just turned our face toward God. And sometimes we'll have people tell us, you turn your back on me. And I said, no, I turn my back toward God. You can turn too if you want. But I'm not going to turn on God in order to to agree with you. I've got to agree with God. After all, we die, He doesn't. He's the resurrector. We're not. We're the resurrectees. Uh, we're not the saviors. He is. We're the saved. So we do what He says. That's just common sense if you have a spirit that's alive rather than dead. But it's not enough to learn God's Word and be shown our unfaithfulness and need to repent. We've actually have not repented unless we had a change of mind with a corresponding change of action. We just quit doing the dumb stuff that we've been doing. Words are cheap, but correct action speaks volumes about our intent and our intentions. And God doesn't bless just talk. He blesses the walk. And so with each step, He steps with you. And with each step, uh, He gets stronger in you. And with each step, more blessings are starting to accrue for blessings in eternity. We are to obey the word and then turn from every wicked way the Bible spells out for us. You're not going to get other people to turn, but you can live the life and the way you live your life as a, as a, as a whole demonstrates that the things that you do that are right have fruit in your life are a blessing to others. So if we turn from our wicked ways, then God will hear from heaven and forgive our sins. If we don't turn from our wicked ways, he's, he's not going to hear. That is, he's not going to acquiesce. He's going to hold that, that's, that uh, judgment in place. So God's no respecter of persons, Romans 2.11. He expects holiness out of the redeemed people. We don't get a pass because we're saved about living holy. Matter of fact, our feet are held to the fire at a higher level than any unsaved person. So he expects holiness out of the redeemed. Holiness comes about through the believer's compliance to Bible doctrine, to the Word of God. And if we confess, 1 John 1, 9, our sins as we should when we have sinned, then he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We don't have to put on a spring or a fall revival and have musicians for a show to get people to come out and start coming to our church. We need to have God's people who confess their sin when they sin instead of waiting at the end of the year to get it right. Because think of all the other sins you're going to be guilty of between then if you wait. Don't wait till the end of the day to confess your sins. As soon as you are cognizant that you have said something stupid, you have stuck your foot in your mouth, you have done something that you shouldn't have done, or you just let your mind fuzz out in thinking about something you shouldn't, stop it. Confess what it was, say what it was that you're, you did or thought or said or, or whatever, and confess it right then because you're back under the filling of the Holy Spirit. Until then, you're going to start chain sinning. The next one is going to, his kinfolk are going to come. That chain, that sin's kinfolk are going to come with jealousy. Envy's going to come. Pride's going to come. Everything else that comes with it, it's going to come right along with it and join right in. They bring the whole family. They'll have a Vandigan out there and they'll be full of them. 
Don't want that to happen. But when we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is practicing righteousness. This is not for, for positional salvation. This is for practicing salvation. That passage is written to believers, not unbelievers. That's why it's a present active subjunctive, present tense. Active voice. It's the things that we do as believers as we live out the Christian life. We're, we're going to, we're going to mess up. But if we confess, get right, seek God's word in his face, then he says, then he will heal their land at the end of that verse. The blight of biblical ignorance and the steady sins of the people of God compounded with all the subsequent suffering that goes along with disobedience to God can be changed if the people will listen and if they will obey the Lord. But when you start substituting 40 different things and giving precedence to 40 different things, the Word of God might get 15 or 20 minutes, and everything else gets gets top billing, then that's when the problem starts becoming uh, skewed in people's minds. They start thinking, well, we'll we're doing the greater good, helping the greater men. Look, you never help to move forward the plan of God when you have the mindset that you must do the greater good for the greater amount of people. Because if you do that, then you're compromising on the things that they have offense at. Because the greater amount of people could care less what God thinks. The greater amount of people are going to hell because they reject the Son of God. And there's no amount of cleaning ditches, putting on shingles, doing all kinds of tutti-frutti good works that's going to turn their coal ice cold heart to Jesus Christ. The Spirit of God takes the gospel to that soul of that person. The Spirit of God either convinces and then converts that sinner or that sinner says no to Jesus Christ. And so there's no conversion. You convict, convince, and convert. And if the Holy Spirit is not doing the convincing, the convicting, to the convincing, and the converting, that's a not a saved person. I don't care if they do everything you could think of in the church. They're not saved. We're going to talk about that in the next hour. There are many people who call Jesus Lord, Lord in John chapter 8, and by the end of the chapter, they wanted to kill him. They said, we believe in Jesus. And by the end of the chapter, 20-some verses later, they wanted to stone him. They wanted to kill him. So there are a lot of people who say they have they believe in Jesus. They're not saved. They'll might they might go to a Christmas show. I call it a show. Christmas uh, sermon. They might go to an Easter sunrise or an Easter service. They believe in the, the who Jesus is. They believe that he rose from the dead, but they're not going to receive him as Lord because they are the God of their life. They are the Lord. No one's going to tell them how they're going to live their life. They won't accept that. They'll accept his person in historical context, but they will not accept his person as a Savior. Sad. But we'll get to that one. Because we're going to talk about the Lordship of Jesus Christ the next hour. Stuff that you already know, of course. A blessed people are responsible people. We know there's a lot of irresponsible people in America, but there's also responsible people. And thank goodness there are. The responsible people, people are hardworking people. They're not expecting somebody to carry the water for them. They're not sitting around waiting after a disaster for somebody to come and, and put them on a bus and haul them somewhere. They didn't got out of Dodge. They're not sitting around waiting. The, the communities that are getting the job done and working hard at it, they're already in Florida and other places, Kentucky, working hard, putting it back together. They're not whining and sitting around waiting. The government is just going out there doing photo ops to make it look like they can, they care. And that's all they're doing. They don't realize that the money that they're supposedly being good hearted about, about giving to those people belong to those people to start with. <laughs> the arrogance of our politician. When they give you the crumbs from the treasury or they give you the crumbs from something, they don't realize that it, not a dime of it belongs to them. As a matter of fact, every penny that they have in their own bank accounts came from them, other than what they've done dirty with the stock market. But most people in a blessed nation, they are responsible, hardworking people. They are caring people. They look out for their neighbor and their family. People who will go out and have sex 
and have babies without getting married and then eventually abandon those kids, they don't care for that girl. That girl maybe not care for that guy. There's a whole lot of women that don't want the man around because she'll lose that government check if he comes around and they get married. There's a lot of people who are just dirty and crooked expecting Uncle Sam to be the big sugar daddy. But God does not waste his blessings when we've studied Proverbs before. That God does not waste his blessings on lazy, proud, sin-sick, wicked people. It's against his character. God calls on people to be holy, industrious, humble, and righteous. Not lazy, proud, sin-sick, and wicked. The Lord calls on his people to obey him at all times. And for those who do, he uses you to make a real impact on your family and your society. You have a strong family. You have strong uh, uh, impact on society. You really do. Much can be said concerning the Lord's blessings upon his people. And it seems the more hostile the enemy or the circumstances, but the brighter the blessing is seen. Blessings always seem to be the brightest when the positive believer's circumstances look the darkest. Never does a cup of water taste so good than when you're completely parched and dry. For the believer who is positive to the word of God, this is always true. He or she has the word of God in their soul to draw upon for their own satisfaction, their own water, and their own bread. The positive perception-oriented believer finds spiritual rest in the promises of God because they have learned not only the promises, but they have developed a trust in the Lord through the consistent intake and adherence to the Word. You trust God. He's come through for you so many times. And the more you apply the Word of God to God, will show you more ways that you can apply the Word. Positive volition begets positive results, and positive results beget fruit. And that fruit begets more of the same kind of fruit. And if you put the right kind of seed in your life and the right kind of fruit in your life, you will keep replicating that type of fruit in your life. You put a fig seed in or whatever, you get a fig back. Like a tomato, you put a a seed in, you'll get a tomato plant, you'll get tomatoes and you keep doing that's what you're going to get. You put in briar seeds and you're going to get briars. The positive believer understands that he or she is under the authority of the Word of God. But the cosmic negative believer does not take the Word of God seriously. They have a take it or leave it attitude. And in essence, they are actually anti-authority. They may not want to admit it, but they are anti-authority oriented taken by, by biblical orders and the doctrinal update instructions from the Word, is a drag. It's boring. It's sometimes even exasperating. It's vexing to the soul that you and I should have to sacrifice something in order to get something in return that is maybe long-term and seeing the fruit from it. We like immediate gratification. And we as Christians need to get away from the mindset of immediate gratification. And too many times in churches today, the drive that keeps those churches big and active and people all excited about them is the sense of immediate emotional gratification from the worship service. That's called the feeding of the flesh through the emotions. And sitting down and learning and growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ is absolutely vexing to the soul. This believer, when their long, dark hours come, fear and calamity will come with it. Proverbs 1, 24 through 31. And as the Apostle John said in 1 John 4, 18, when their fear comes, it will bring torment or mental anguish because they have not allowed the Word of God to develop a love for God above all things uh, in their life. 1 John 2, 5 is my E.T., Uh, Neil Diamond song, you know, uh, let your heart light shine or whatever. And 2.5 says that our love for God is brought to maturity through the inhale of the word of God. 
And I thought about that song for some reason yesterday. That that mind that, that song just kept going over and over in my head. And that, you know, that's a long time ago when it came out, you know. <laughs> but it would not leave my little pea brain. Your heart light. <laughs> E.T. phone home, you know. And they had the tune in that song and turn on your heart light. Well, the Word of God turns on the heart light. And in essence, you start to love God. And that devotion is seen... It 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 uh, saturates your your thinking. It saturates my thinking. Nothing gets in the way of it, but doesn't mean things aren't going to try to. Well, in the nation, God will heal the land, and that's what it will look like. That we'll have a love for God and a love for people. The positive believer who really wants to walk close with the Lord is somewhat oblivious to what his or her faith has led them into. I'll say that again. <laughs> Have you ever asked yourself when you're doing the work of God in some form or fashion, Lord, what have I gotten myself into? Because your first intent was to help. And maybe, as the old saying goes, no good deed goes unpunished. (laughs) That's okay. God's the one we're looking for the blessings for anyway, because those are eternal. But the believer who really wants to walk closely with the Lord is somewhat oblivious to what their faith will lead them into. I had people laugh in my face when I asked them, when I told them I was I was called into the ministry and I was going off to Bible college. People I'd known for years in this church years ago, they're dead and gone now. Good riddance to them. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm just teasing. Hey, it was their volition to said the dumb things they said. They were supposed to be my mature mentors. My tour, my foot. They were just churchy people. Some of them were. Not all of them, but some of them were. But some in particular. As my friend Melvin used to say, man, he's a trip. He's a trip. But the positive believer does not worry about the results of their faithfulness. They just live it. My saying is don't worry about the mule, just load the wagon. Not to be disrespectful, just put it in a parabolic term. But the positive believer does not see the commandments of God, as 1 John 5, 1 through 3 says, as grievous. Oh, my word. That one rare really got to me when I taught that for the third time. First John 5. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Son, is that Christ is born of God. Everyone that loves Him, that loveth, begot, loveth Him also, that is begotten of Him. That is, we love the Father and the Son and fellow believers. And this we know, that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. For this is the love, or our love, And actually in the Greek, it's not of, it's for, it's the objective genitive here, gar. For this is our love for God, that we keep his commandments. And primarily unconditional love comes first. That we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. Oh, for some believers, they're thinking to follow the commandment of God. It is an absolute burden. It's like a ball and the word of God is like a ball and chain to so many believers. But you tickle their innards with something emotional and all of a sudden it's just they just got all holiness just rolls all over them. They just get real holy. Not really. But our mental attitude toward the word of God is our attitude toward God himself. We cannot separate the two because Christ Jesus, John 1, 1, is the word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory as that of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. So we want to make our life count. Well, that means God has to count first. We know that. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for this day, for Your blessings, for Your kindness, for the mercy that You show us, for the things that You show us that sometimes are... Sometimes hard to swallow, sometimes hard to to repeat and keep on living out in our lives. But we know that we can live those lives out by your grace, your power and your strength. Thank you for everyone that's turned out. We ask your blessings on their lives, on the application of your word as it matches with their needs 
And we pray, Father, that you'll continue to help us to meet the needs and that we'll help meet each other's needs by your grace, your word, and your providence as we let you meet our needs. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.